welcome back to the Cerberus Saga. We are very close to the end now. This is probably the penultimate uh, episode of the saga. And as you can see here, Cerberus is already in its case. <laughs> These are two uh, transparent uh, acrylic plates. They are made for micro ATX uh, boards. Because the Cerberus board is made according to the uh, micro ATX uh, standard, uh, it already has the holes that are needed uh, uh, for us to use just a standard uh, uh, micro ATX transparent plexiglass uh, tray. These are meant as trays, so for the bottom part. Uh, but I just uh, bought two trays, uh, I think it's about $25 each, including all the screws and standoffs. And then I put a tray on the bottom and a tray on the top. <laughs> and there we have uh, a case. I took some precautions, like uh, in between the standoffs and the board, there are plastic washers on both sides. That's not to damage uh, uh, the, board, uh, the board mechanically and also isolate electrically. Plexiglass is prone to static electricity, uh, so taking some precautions uh, uh, is a good idea. So now let's just connect it, turn on the little screen. Right, that's the keyboard in here. That's a uh, 9 volt DC power supply in there and this is our VGA monitor it goes in there now um, what's happening now and call your attention to this I was using this EEPROM here with the character definitions burned in it uh, for development and test uh, I've now removed it and put the final actual uh, dual ported character memory instead. And what the BIOS code, the basic input output system running from CAT, what it's doing now, it's going to this micro SD card during boot, uh, uh, downloading the character definitions from the micro SD card into CAT, and then from CAT it's uploaded all the character definitions into the character memory. So for the first second or two, uh, after you turn on the computer, you will see garbage on the screen because the video memory will have undefined contents and so will the character memory. Um, and I thought some time ago, maybe I'll put a little 555 uh, timing circuit here on the top side to stop the VGA circuitry from producing an image until everything is uploaded and everything is neat so we don't see garbage on the screen. But then I thought, you know what, Cerberus is meant as an open educational platform to make the gut of the computer visible, so I'll now let that be visible as well when we turn on the computer. Here's what you get. Let me turn it on now. You see, there was some garbage there. Yeah, this, this display reacts very slowly, so you didn't really see the garbage on the screen much. Let me turn it off and on again. Yeah, you hardly saw it. This display is very slow. This vertical streaking here is an artifact of this little display. You don't see that on a proper VGA monitor. This is from my security system. <laughs> this is for security cameras. It's a piece of crap. I'm just using it so you can see everything in the frame at once. Um, I have some uh, good and bad news. Uh, um, the good news is uh, the BIOS code, I'm calling, it, I'm calling it BIOS now, basic input output system instead of kernel, and I'll explain you the reasons why. But the BIOS code running on CAT is done, Cerberus is complete, it's a fully usable uh, computer. Um, the bad news, however, is that I was able to put less functionality on CAT than I wanted to. So now we have 
a rather bare bones uh, machine code monitor and a rather bare bones uh, file system to to save, load and delete files from the micro SD card and list the directory and so forth. So it's completely functional, it's usable. Um, but although I'm using only about 70% of code memory and only about 70% of dynamic memory, the onboard memories of this chip here, uh, the Atmega 328P, although it's at 70%, uh, I was already running into all kinds of low memory issues, like files that wouldn't open, or they would open but they wouldn't close, uh, things that wouldn't run. Um, although the code was perfectly correct, it's just that the Arduino IDE, the integrated development environment of the Arduino, which I'm using to code for CAT, uh, it's quite simple. It does not have a model of dynamic memory usage, so the compiler uh, is not even issuing warnings yet about uh, the amount of dynam dynamic memory you have, and you already run into all kinds of trouble, which are very, very difficult to debug because they look completely arbitrary. There is nothing wrong with your code, and yet you're having an issue. Luckily, uh, yeah, two decades ago, I worked for a couple of years with a compiler team. I mean, I, I was a processor designer, but um, I, we were designing VLIW processors, very long instruction word processors, which are almost always co-designed with their compilers, because the compiler assumes a lot of the responsibility that traditionally would be up to the hardware. So I had some experience in compiler building, so I, I knew how to go about solving the problems purely because I had a little bit of this highly specialist background. Otherwise, I would be completely blind. But anyway, the price was that a lot of the functionality I wanted, I couldn't add, and I even had to remove some functionality that was already there uh, in order to make space for new functionality that was absolutely needed. For instance, before, uh, you, you may remember, if I would type a command, execute it and if I would press the up arrow key, that command would be repeated. I wouldn't need to retype it. The computer would remember what was the last command I typed. I had to remove that because it was using <laughs> 32 bytes or 38 bytes uh, of memory that I just couldn't afford to use for that. So I had to remove some comfort features uh, in order to make space for the essential uh, features. Um, uh, I've added a few other features that I will show you now. I will go through all the, the, the uh, instructions or, or, or the commands we have now uh, on the monitor. Um, this is a sort of bare bones machine code monitor um, and it has the BIOS uh, built into it uh, in CAD as well. So for instance, um, there is a soft reset on servers now. Uh, there's no reset button on it, but if you type a reset on the command line, uh, the whole machine will re reboot itself. And uh, it's not only the appearance of a reboot, it will actually reset both the CPUs, CAT will reset, and the BIOS code will be executed from the beginning. So this is an actual reset. And during the reset, two files, uh, I mean, uh, during the power on, two files are accessed uh, in the microSD card. So the microSD card is a necessity. Cerberus will not boot correctly without a microSD card inserted with at least these two files. One of them is just for, for kicks. It's this uh, little icon here or this thumbnail for Cerberus so the screen doesn't start bare. The other one is the character definitions. <laughs> and you need those char character definitions to be there so CAT can upload them into the uh, character memory in order to display anything on the screen. Otherwise, you just go get garbage on the screen. That's why this socket is still there, because if for some reason the file system is down, it's not working and you want to debug it, you can remove this dual ported memory and add an EEPROM with the character definitions burned in, so at least you can then debug uh, the computer. But you need these two files here, otherwise the computer will issue an error. And if you, uh, uh, if you just uh, remove uh, the microSD card, which is more difficult to access now, so I just uh, pushed it out, pulled it out a little bit so the computer will not see it. If you turn the computer on without the microSD card, this is what you get. You, of course, get garbage on the screen because this is just the residual contents of the video memory and the character memory. Uh, it, they will lose their contents over time with the computer power down. 
and then you get this audio alert. And this is the computer's way, let me stop this now, the, that, uh, that uh, audio error code, error uh, sound, um, is Cerberus's way of telling you that uh, there is a problem even though Cerberus can't display anything on the screen to tell you about the problem. So it will just give you an audio uh, feedback signal uh, when there is uh, no uh, micro SD card. It will also give you a signal, a non-repetitive one, it will just beep when it can't, file, can't find the character definitions in there. So you know that something has gone wrong instead of assuming that the screen is just garbage. All right, um, there is a file system now, so if we type dir uh, directory, uh, it will list uh, the files in the system. It, it looks as well, I put a lot of irrelevant files there just to test the functionality, um, but uh, when it runs out of screen space, it will ask you to press a key and then it will list the rest of the files. Uh, the files in question, if you press ESC, it will just stop. And the files that are relevant here are these two chardevs.bin and serbicon.img. I'm calling it an IMG file now instead of a text file because it's not quite, I mean, strictly speaking, it's a text file, but it contains um, the ASCII codes of the characters to be displayed on the screen. So in that sense, it's kind of specific to Cerberus. So I'm calling it an image file, an IMG file. And this is just binary, bin for binary, because the char definitions character definitions are loaded as a binary file that goes straight uh, into memory uh, from the micro SD card to cat and into memory. Um, files can be loaded uh, with the load command. Uh, the contents of memory can be listed. Uh, I'm not using peak anymore because I run out of space. So I implemented another command called list, which is more uh, uh, robust. Um, the code memory uh, let, let me show you first the, the, the character definition space. Uh, the character memory starts at address F000. All numbers you put uh, on Cerberus, they are assumed to be hexadecimal. So these are all hexadecimal numbers. You don't even need to put the dollar sign because Cerberus will only understand hexadecimal numbers here on the command line. So if we list the contents of uh, the memory map from address F000, we will get the character uh, definitions. And you see now it's listing uh, eight bytes per line uh, and then all the lines that it can show on the screen. So these, uh, these are the current uh, character uh, definitions. If we change something here, uh, we will change the character definitions. For instance, um, the first eight bytes here on the first line are the definitions of this character here, the cursor character, which has uh, code zero. So th this, this is the very first character, the cursor. If we change that, and we can change that by typing a memory address starting with zero X. So there's no poke anymore. This is shorter, more efficient, saved memory. We just type zero X and then the address you want to change in this case, zero, zero, zero. And then you just type in the bytes you want uh, to be uh, inserted in memory from that address onwards. You can type as many or as, as few bytes you want. You can type only one byte, in which case you will change only one address, or a whole series of them, whatever fits on the line, and then you will change that many addresses. So we can, actually I haven't done this before, so we can try to redefine uh, the cursor character <laughs> and see what happens. Um, that's the following. First one uh, corresponds to the top line of the character. So let's say this is a full line, FF. Uh, then let's do six zeros and then uh, another full line. So this, this strong man should be replaced by two lines on the screen. Let's see if this will work. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's your cursor character now. Uh, it's just uh, two lines. <laughs> <laughs> walking on the screen. Um, of course, you can uh, undo all this by just typing reset and then the computer will reload the character memory and we have the cursor uh, back there. So if we go back to F00, you see that uh, uh, the character definitions have returned. Um, uh, so there's a file system now. So let's say um, we want to load a file 
So char definitions is a file. So let's load character devs.bin. Um, but if I just type load and the name, it will load in the uh, instruction um, memory area. That's the default of load. It will load everything um, in the instruction memory area. And the instruction memory area starts at uh, address 202 in hex. So there's just garbage there right now. So if we say load char bin and don't give an address, it will load the char uh, character definitions here. So let's see, it starts with F2, FF and 58 right now. If I load it, it should change. And then we list 202 again after loading. Yeah, so uh, that has now changed. So everything here are character definitions. Um, we can we can play a trick and 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 uh, premeditatedly <laughs> screw servers up. So um, the char character definitions, uh, when you load them, uh, they go to F000. But if we load them on F000, say A, <laughs> then they will be loaded totally out of alignment, and that should screw everything up. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Yeah, everything is screwed up. <laughs> if I test the memory now uh, with the look, everything gets screwed up. It's uh, this is what the characters are, are looking like right now. So yeah, you can load binary files anywhere in memory, uh, and you have access to Cerberus's entire memory space. So you have to be careful as a user not to poke something in the wrong place. For instance, if I do uh, F800 is the start of the video area. So if I poke something at F8, I don't know, 0F, and then just put uh, just put uh, garbage there, uh, and you, uh, you are basically putting that on the screen memory. You see? That's what you get here. This is what I, I, I inserted. Um, and then, of course, when you uh, apply the command and just apply it, it automatically lists from the point in memory where you started changing something. So this is what I typed in, F, 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 1, 11, 11, 11. Um, and the result is that this has been added to, to the screen memory. So you basically, you can do anything um, with, with Cerberus. You, <laughs> you better know your, uh, your, your memory map, know what you're doing because Cerberus does not block access to anything as, a, as a, an educative uh, platform. Yeah, I figured it's better to lower the camera a little bit so you see better, um, although I'm not sure you are seeing any better. Yeah, it just looks better. All right, what else do we have? So we have directory, we have load, we also have save uh, uh, and delete. So I'll delete two files here that I've used before, these two test files. These are also binary files, but they, they are code, they are executables. Um, so if I delete the 6502.bin, there is no shortcut here. You have to type out the entire file name. There just isn't enough memory on the Atmega to add much more than the bare minimum. So I delete that. So if we do directory again, yeah, that's gone. There is only one more test, z80.bin. So let's delete that. Yeah, so they are deleted, and now, and uh, you, you will understand why I, why I deleted that. Let's go to fast mode to it's in four megahertz now. Let's go to eight uh, megahertz. So we are in fast mode now. And now, if I type the test CPU command you've seen before, that command will load uh, a small assembly program in memory uh, here in the low memory for uh, the 6502 here to execute. And that's the, the little typewriter application you have seen. Multiple uh, times, but I made a mistake. Uh, never mind. It's just a typewriter application. Um, if I press escape now and I go back to the monitor, those instructions are still in memory, starting from address 202, which is now the beginning of the code area. So this, these are the instructions until this, until address 212. And the rest is whatever was there before. So now we can save 
that program, we say we can save uh, uh, servers save from address 202 to address 212 under the name tst6502.bin. So it will take the contents of this range in memory, uh, in binary, and put it in a file that it will create, tst6502. Let's see if it works. Directory, there it is, tst6502.bin. Um, now, because that is already Oops, because that's already in the in the code area which starts at 202 uh, if I type a new command called run uh, what this command will do it will tell whatever processor is selected in this case the 6502 to go to address 202 and start executing from there and it will find the application that, that I just put in there when I typed test CPU so it will be the byte uh, I think the, the, the typewriter application but if I now go to Z80 mode, so I'm in Z80 mode, and I type test CPU, then that part of memory will be overwritten with the same typewriter application, but now in Z8 assembly. So if I list it again, you see these are different opcodes that you see here, and they go, they go until here. Here they stop. This two here is a leftover of what was there before, which was the 6502 code. The Z80 code is shorter, it stops here. So now I am in Z80, and this is what is in memory, the Z80 code. So if I now go to 6502 mode, the contents of the code memory will still be the same. Z80 code, and now I am in 6502 mode. If I type run now, it will clear the screen, but it will do nothing because that was Z80 code. It was not 6502 code. But suppose I didn't have the test CPU uh, command built in. Uh, suppose all I had was this, test6502.bin. It's like having a program on the disk. So I will load that program, test6502.binary. So now it's loaded if we go to beginning of the code area. You see the code is different uh, now, it ends here. I know because it ends with twice two. <laughs> uh, if I type run now, then we will have the proper 6502 code. So this is working. Um, let's do the same with the Z8. We go to Z80 mode and then we test the CPU, which will put a built-in program into RAM. And it's the same uh, program, the same typewriter application. So now we will have Z80 assembly here, finishing here. So we do the same trick, save 202, and now it goes to 211, test Z80.binary. So if you now ask the director, there it is, test Z80.binary. So now what we will do is we'll go to uh, 6502 mode, Test the CPU just to erase that part of memory. Um, then go back to Z80, and then that part of memory will have uh, the 6502 assembly. If you just run it now under Z80 mode, uh, nothing, nothing is going to happen because it's these are the wrong uh, instructions, the wrong assembly program. So what we now do is we will load uh, uh, test Z80. Binary. If you mistake the name of the file, it will just tell you that uh, the file doesn't exist. So it has all the error messages built in as well. I consider those essential, so it's all built in. So test z80.bin. So this should be loaded now in the code area. There it is. Finishes with 2 and 2. If I now type run, it will execute the typewriter application on the Z80. Um, yeah, that's pretty much uh, what is in there right now. You can type multiple bytes, uh, entry multiple bytes uh, with that entry entry uh, command. So if we list, say, the contents of memory from zero, um, you get this. So suppose I want to put zero on all the first eight bytes, I just type zero zero and then the eight bytes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And once I've done that, 
they are all zero. But if I go and test memory, which will uh, uh, load uh, multiple instances uh, of, uh, of the character set um, into multiple addresses in all memories, reading and writing from all memories, then these contents will change. So that's the test memory function you've seen before. And if I go now to list zero, that's what the test memory function has done. It puts zero, one, two, three, four, and these will be interpreted as uh, character codes, uh, token codes, um, that um, each one of them will correspond to a certain character definition in the character memory. And as I've shown you, you can change those character definitions. The character memory starts at F00, zero. Uh, and if you just poke into this code, you can build any crazy character you want, as I've shown you in the beginning. So I think that covers it, if not everything, at least most of it, everything that is relevant. Um, so that's the BIOS uh, of servers. I really could not put more than what you saw here in a stable way. Uh, in the available uh, code memory of CAT, of the little Atmega 328, which of course, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm complaining about uh, the Atmega having a uh, little memory, uh, but I chose the chip, I chose the smallest controller, because I wanted the controller to be a lot less than the CPUs, the heart of the system is the CPUs, I didn't want to use a super duper controller there, uh, which would be more complex than the whole of Cerberus, it defeats the point, so I put a very, very simple one, which also happens to have a, a little memory. Uh, so I can't blame Microchip for it, and uh, I'm also complaining about the Arduino IDE, the Integrated Development Environment, which is not smart enough to, to, to have a compiler that will tell you if you're really going to run into runtime uh, uh, short, short, shortage uh, of memory problems. Um, it gives you a warning after 75% of dynamic memory is predicted to be used, but I'm running into all kinds of problems from 69%. It doesn't even give me a, uh, uh, didn't even give me a warning, and I complain about that. On the other hand, you know, in all honesty, uh, this Atmega and the Arduino IDE they were never meant to be used in the way I'm using them to control a full-blown multi-process, multi-CPU, 8-bit uh, computer. Um, those things were made for small microcontroller projects to drive little motors or to control your alarm system at home. Simple little things. And I'm basically using everything uh, out of this uh, Atmega chip. I'm using every single pin. I'm using every bit of memory, every bit of functionality except uh, 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 the, D the DACs, the digital to analog converters, uh, or, or the other way around, the ADCs, the analog to digital converters. So th those are the only things I'm not using. I'm using everything else, all the interrupt parts, uh, and on the I'm using an external clock. Okay, um, but anyway, I am not only using uh, this controller and the IDE, I am abusing of them, I'm pushing them to limits they were never meant to, to probe, let alone to f work stably, um, doing so much. Um, so I should stop complaining. Um, it, it is surprising how far I actually could push them. That doesn't mean that Cerberus will be restricted to this simple functionality, because uh, once I release it in the wild, uh, hopefully um, before the end of the spring this year, 2021, um, and I'm recording this uh, the very early spring, second or third day of spring, um, once it's released, I hope the community will build applications for it that run on the CPUs. And once the application runs on the CPUs, you don't have memory problems anymore because there are 64 kilobytes of usable memory. Remember, Cerberus does not use a ROM. Uh, uh, so it does not dedicate any part of the address space for the ROM. Uh, the ROM, the, which is in fact a flash, is built into CAT. So it does not use uh, the address space at all. Uh, which is the great advantage. So anybody programming for one of the CPUs or both will have the full 64 kilobytes to use, the whole of it, including 
the memory that retains the character definitions, which can be reprogrammed by the user. So there will be no memory shortage there. I hope the community will build uh, good applications for servers, including utilities like a proper, proper assembler or maybe you know, a, a, a better, a more sophisticated machine code monitor than what I've just shown you and games and all kinds of other applications running on the CPUs. I can do that as well, and maybe I will, uh, but only after I release servers into the wild. I don't want to keep on gating the release of servers anymore. There are only two things I will do before I release. I want to, to port one game for each CPU. Current plan is I will port Breakout for the Z80, and Centipede for the 6502. I may change my mind uh, five times over before I actually do it, but that's what I'm thinking right now. And the reason I want to do this porting before I release is that it, it will serve as a kind of stress test. Uh, I want to see an, an actual game running on servers before I put it out there in the wild, just you know, for my own um, uh, uh, peace of mind. And I want to finish the documentation. Uh, I cannot release something that is not documented. It's the same as not releasing. It becomes useless, even dangerous. So I will port these two games, hopefully, and write the documentation, and then I will release it, and then I may turn my attention to writing a proper assembler to run in one of the CPUs. Or maybe my attention will go to the next hardware project, which is what I think is going to happen, because I'm more interested in hardware. Um, and then I hope the community will write good utilities for Cerberus, and I hope there will be an ecosystem created for it. Um, in the meantime, that's it for now. I hope you've enjoyed this. There will be at least one more episode uh, in this series in which I will demonstrate at least one of the games I hope to port um, and, and do a final pass, a final recap of what Cerberus is, how it works. Um, or maybe the second part I will leave for yet another episode, which would be nice because it would then be I think today we are in episode, eight, episode 18, so uh, it would be 20 episodes <laughs> if I would separate that. So yeah, I'll probably do 20 episodes or 19, I don't know, we will see, but today is not the last. Uh, um, worst case, it's the penultimate uh, episode, the one before the last. I hope you've enjoyed it, and um, stay tuned, there will be more next time, and I'll see you then.